Good evening. It's May 24th, 2021, and I hope your Monday is going well. I also hope your weekend went well. Mine was pretty productive. Um, we're having a lot of rain here in Houston. I don't know what part of the country you're watching this from, but if you're in the Houston area, you're probably getting a lot of rain, and hopefully you have your garden planted or seeds in the ground or plants in the ground or something growing because this is great gardening weather. Today's topic is going to be on a topic that many of you may be familiar with, uh, infrared therapy. Some of you may have gone to saunas before, may have gone to heat saunas or infrared saunas. Um, and so I've been doing some research on this. And of course, you know, we at Montgomery Heart and Wellness are often looking for ways that we can improve the health and wellness of our patients. And, and I'm frequently uh, looking at the medical literature and, and seeing how we can add some modalities to the care of our patient. And so I've been looking into infrared sauna off and on for some time. And of course, my busy schedule doesn't let me do exhaustive you know, research on an ongoing basis. But, basis. but recently, I have been <clears throat> looking at this therapy. And uh, of course, over the previous months, I've been really surprised at the amount of scientific data that is um, available uh, and a lot of scientific work that's been done uh, for the looking at the benefits of infrared sauna therapy. So we're going to be looking at the benefits of infrared sauna therapy uh, and um, the mechanisms, what is it uh, and how could it help you. So, you know, grab a pen and paper, sit back, stay tuned. We have a great show for you tonight. Look forward to uh, getting on with this uh, great topic. Okay, we're back. And as I said, benefits of infrared sauna. Uh, hello, TRZ and hello, Todd Kirk. Thanks for your uh, joining us early today. And hello to everyone else. Um, you know, infrared therapy is something I've, I've actually gotten into infrared therapy uh, machines before uh, at various times. May have done it maybe a total of four times. Um, what I was not aware of is the uh, amount of scientific work that's been done. Oftentimes when you have um, uh, modalities that are not in the traditional allopathic uh, realm, <clears throat> oftentimes we don't have a lot of the funding uh, that you know traditional allopathic therapies have. You have the you know big industries such as big device industries, big pharma, and they have large budgets and they can do these large studies looking at this drug and looking at that drug or this device, et cetera. And so they have the ability to do these large studies. And, and uh, of course, you know, they have some influence, quote unquote, in the medical society so they can get these large studies done, presented at the large medical meetings. And uh, these become some of the standard of care. Uh, however, oftentimes there are therapeutic modalities that are outside the realm of allopathic therapies that are very effective, I would say, as effective and perhaps more effective. There's some things that are on the realm. For instance, we have a therapy that we use in um, our, our treatment center for patients with heart disease and angina is called ECP therapy, external counterpulsation therapy. In fact, I'll probably do a show on that because I think that's something that more people need to know about. Um, external counterpulsation therapy uh, uses a device <clears throat> that um, was you know, designed probably thousands of years ago. Uh, maybe a thousand years ago, I'll say that much. Uh, but uh, the more recent uh, design of that machine as, uh, was model, actually the, the intraoretic bloom pump, which is a allopathic device that we use in the hospital on a regular basis, was modeled after the ECP machine. Uh, and the ECP machine has uh, a lot of uh, effectiveness in terms of improving coronary flow, reducing what we call cardiac ischemia, and reducing chest pain for people with blocked coronary arteries uh, who 
say may not be a candidate for surgery or may not be a candidate for angioplasty or who may elect not to do it because of various reasons. So you may have other you know, comorbidities that put them at risk uh, for kidney failure or the like. And so they get this therapy. And this therapy we've been using for 20 years, very effective. Patients get lots of clinical improvement. Uh, chest pain gets severely reduced, it goes away. Uh, they get improvement in cardiac function and so on and so forth. So that's a modality, even though it is part of allopathic medicine, it's on the fringes as something that's not well recognized. And, uh, and there are other modalities that are very effective that we don't use so commonly uh, in uh, allopathic medicine. And infrared uh, uh, sonotherapy therapy is one of those areas that I've come to discover. It has lots of clinical data uh, and strong data, as I'll share with you today, uh, but it's something that's not uh, used in mainstream uh, medicine. So <clears throat> I think it's important for us to look at a lot of these things and get some understanding. Hello, Deborah Payne. Hello, Barbara Perlis, uh, Bradley Thomas. Hello, Catherine Welch. Hello. Uh, good evening. Uh, I have sunlight, uh, light and infrared home sun. I love it. Okay, great. Uh, you can tell us some about it, uh, Barbara. You're going to have some great questions for us. So without further ado, I want to get into this. Uh, so what are the healing benefits of um, infrared sauna or infrared therapy? Now, you'll probably see me uh, use a lot of different terminologies because there are different terminologies used by uh, different scientists in the medical literature. Now, all of it's infrared and it's generally far infrared uh, therapy. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, the difference in them. <clears throat> so part one of today's discussion is what is infrared therapy? What's the definition? And what's uh, what are some of the mechanisms of infrared therapy? Uh, and so, and it's important to get the, the uh, mechanism and, and understand what we're talking about because, you know, when people talk about, you know, heat saunas, they may be talking about different things. Uh, and so uh, when we get into this, especially when I start to share some of the scientific uh, data with you, uh, we will talk about uh, some of the specifics in terms of the protocols, especially the ones with the cardiovascular data. So IRT or infrared therapy uses certain wavelengths uh, of light uh, and are delivered in sites, uh, to, to certain sites of eye. So in short, you know, in the infrared therapy is light therapy. And uh, it's a certain wavelength, certain range of wavelength uh, that's used. Uh, it can help cells regenerate and repair themselves. Uh, and so uh, it has the ability to penetrate below the skin layers for treatment of deep tissues and organs. And so now there are different ranges of infrared therapy that goes deep in the tissue. For instance, you know, far infrared uh, penetrates deep and you feel heat, you know, uh, near infrared is more superficial. Uh, it has a vast range of health benefits, but it doesn't have the damaging effects of ultraviolet radiation. So I was talking about to this, uh, discussing this with my son. I said, well, you know, wait a minute. That, does it have UV radiation? It does not have the uh, damaging effects of UV radi uh, radiation. Uh, it's the heat that you feel when you have the sun exposure, uh, but without the uh, ultraviolet radiation uh, exposure. Uh, and sun exposure overall is healthy. There's data that show that people with more sun exposure tend to do better health-wise and have less cancer than people with less sun exposure. So the whole avoidance of sun, I think, is one that I think has been overblown. This gives you a, a pictorial array of uh, a, a, a spectrum, if you will, of uh, infrared light therapy and how it compares to other waveforms. These are wave energies. And so you have X-rays, uh, which has you know a higher frequency. Then you get into ultraviolet light, then the uh, visible spectrum. So you get spectrums of white light, of course, which is all colors. As you see, the white light comes, you have different colors like you know, red light and green, blue and green and purple light. So these are different wavelengths within the spectrum of white light that's broken. And so you have the infrared that's like beyond 700 nanometers up to about a thousand nanometers. So it starts to, it's where the uh, red ends and the radio waves uh, begin uh, is where you have the infrared uh, um, waveform. And so that's going to be uh, what we're talking about today. Uh, how does it work? I mean, what, you know, we gave some insights into that. One, it penetrates uh, the inner layers of the skin about two to seven centimeters deep. Um, it 
<clears throat> reaches muscles, nerves, and even uh, bones. So it uh, actually penetrates and has an effect on cells and tissues. Uh, so it's having a direct penetration, a direct effect on cells and tissues. Uh, the optimal frequency, as I alluded to earlier, is between 700 to 1,000 nanometers. Uh, it allows people to harness the benefits of the sun without the harmful ultraviolet uh, rays of the sun. Uh, and so that's something that is uh, very, very uh, beneficial. So it's sort of taking the good and leaving some of the adverse effects of light therapy. Hello, Patrice Moshe, Karen Evans, Reginald Sykes. How are you doing this evening? Good to have you here. Um, and so infrared light is absorbed by photoreceptors in the cells. So there's certain molecules inside cells that can receive the uh, infrared uh, light energy. Uh, and it has biochemical effects as we'll talk about uh, to a certain extent later. I'm not gonna get into all the details, but I'll, I'll make some references to some articles that I've uh, reviewed uh, that does get into some of the uh, details. So once it's absorbed, infrared therapy initiates metabolic events. Uh, it triggers natural cellular processes in the body. And this is one thing that really fascinated me. It actually has biochemical effects. When you think of an energy source, a light energy source, you think of it coming and having sort of a, a mechanical for, you know, uh, effect. When we think of energy, we think of heat, uh, radiation. We think, okay, it, it heats something up. It can boil it, burn it, and damage it. Uh, but, you know, the heat energy or, or waveforms have specific effects that are biochemical in nature. And so it's almost like uh, the infrared uh, waveform is going in and having some specific molecular uh, effects within a cell. And, and so it, there's scientific evidence showing that, which was quite fascinating. So one of the key benefits is that it increases nitric oxide. So nitric oxide is a molecule that has a number of different important uh, uh, biochemical and physiological uh, uh, effects. Uh, it relaxes arteries. So when I was in medical school, <clears throat> we knew certain medications uh, acted by some molecule that caused the blood vessels to dilate. And we knew the molecule, the, the mechanism or the, or the substance came from endothelial cells. The endothelial cells are the cells that line the blood vessels uh, of arteries. Uh, these are arteries in the periphery, arteries in the heart, the brain. Uh, all arteries have an inner lining called endothelial cells, sort of like a carpet. And so uh, these cells have an important role. And one of the roles is that they release this special molecule that has uh, a lot of beneficial effects on blood vessels. They relax smooth muscles, allows the vessels to dilate. They uh, prevent blood clotting by preventing uh, 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 platelets from sticking. So when I was in medical school, we didn't know what this molecule was, but we just called it endothelial relaxation factor. And later on, it uh, became discovered that this was nitric oxide. And so um, a scientist re received the Nobel Prize for this uh, discovery. And we, once we discovered nitric oxide, lots of other questions came about in terms of its function, effectiveness. It has lots of biochemical effects. Uh, as I said, re relaxes our arteries, it reduces oxidative stress, it helps regulate blood pressure, uh, prevents platelet clumping, and uh, hence clot formation, as I said earlier. Uh, and it enhances overall blood circulation. So uh, put a, 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 a a pin in this segment here, because when we start to talk about some of the clinical effects, I'm going to share some studies with you uh, uh, on the cardiovascular effects of uh, of uh, IRT that is going to be important for us to know in terms of uh, its effects on nitric oxide. Another key, be key benefit is the effect on mitochondrial cells. You know, mitochondrial cells, uh, I've been paying a lot of attention to mitochondrial cells lately. Uh, in the management of our patients. And so when we use supplements, of course, we uh, are, um, use the foundation of our therapy is optimal nutrition. So we start there, uh, high antioxidant plant-based diet, uh, and we manipulate the diet with intermittent fasting. But some of the things that we uh, do as an adjunct to that is provide superfoods or super supplements that enhances mitochondrial function. Uh, and it's important uh, to do this because the mitochondria 
is the organelle within the cell that probably is one of the most important organelles of the cell, perhaps maybe as important as the nucleus, or maybe secondary to the nucleus, which has the DNA of the cell. But secondary to the nucleus, the mitochondria is probably the most important function of the cell. It's the energy machinery. Lots of important biochemical reactions happen in the mitochondria. One important biochemical reaction is the production of ATP or adenosine triphosphate, which is the energy currency of our body. So heart muscles function more effectively or cells function more effectively with ATP. So mitochondrial health and well-being is important. And, and so infrared therapy can, therapy can have a, a, an effect on mitochondrial cells, positive effect. It enhances ATP production, as I alluded to earlier, promotes antioxidation uh, for healing. Uh, the mitochondria has lots of biochemical reactions that uh, creates antioxidants. So for instance, glutathione is, a, is an antioxidant molecule uh, that can uh, is an important molecule for antioxidant reactions. Uh, as you remember from some of our other discussions, uh, what is an antioxidant? An antioxidant is just a molecule that donates an electron to uh, a free radical, an unstable molecule that is missing an electron. And so if you have an antioxidant that donates an electron, it reduces that molecule and it stabilizes it, therefore reducing uh, the potential uh, harmful effects. And if you have lots of unstable molecules floating around, uh, you know, they're causing cellular damage, tissue damage. And so antioxidant effects uh, are important. And so, you know, medic, uh, excuse me, uh, foods that you consume or nutrients that you consume that are quote unquote antioxidants have to work uh, by cellular mediators such as the mitochondria. Uh, so, you know, production of glutathione, we give our patients a supplement called MSM, methylsulfonyl methane. And uh, this elemental sulfur, sulfur agent uh, allows for the production, or I should say enhances uh, the production of uh, glutathione by the mitochondria. And so more glutathione production, it creates more antioxidants effect. Also glutathione being a super antioxidant, it allows uh, for um, uh, the half-life of vitamin C uh, to, um, to be increased. And so it allows for recycling of vitamin C, which is another important antioxidant. Uh, and it's also a great anti-cancer molecule. So we'll give our patients a supplement of MSM plus a liposomal vitamin C, which are two antioxidants that are very important, especially if they're fighting cancer and heart disease or systemic inflammatory conditions. Uh, and so we, we provide these supplements and infrared therapy is a, a therapy that we're gonna be adding to our armamentary in the very near future, so stay tuned. Um, and it also uh, could promote pro-oxidative uh, uh, function of the uh, mitochondria. So now <clears throat> I just talked about antioxidation. Now, why would I want to do something to create pro-oxidation? You know, it's really the opposite. So in other words, you're going to create more reactive oxygen species. Well, uh, that's important from the standpoint of the immune cells. So for instance, if you have a cancer, you have a you know, bacteria or viral infection, let's say you, know, you catch COVID, your immune cells have to you know, be able to destroy these foreign agents, whether it's a cancer cell, a bacteria, a virus. Well, you know, the mechanism by which it does that is, I mean, it has to have bullets, right? You know, if you know, somebody invades your home, you have a gun, you shoot them. Now, you don't want to shoot the bullets at yourself or your family members. You want to shoot the bullets at the foreign uh, uh, invaders. And so, you know, creating pro-oxidative or uh, reactive oxidative species is important also because you want your immune cells to have its own, you know, guns. You know, the body has, you know, utilizes the Second Amendment, I guess, and it has its own weapons that it utilizes against uh, foreign invaders. And so, you know, promoting pro-oxidation uh, for immune uh, purposes is important as well. And so, again, the body is very wise in terms of what it's able to do. And uh, there's certain natural treatments that enhance it. So what are some of the physiological effects of IRT? Um, well, when you're in infrared, uh, in your sauna and getting infrared therapy, we do know that the skin temperature increases. Uh, there's an increased amount of sweating. Uh, this typically happens because there's deep tissue, uh, increase in temperature of deep tissue. Uh, so the body goes into a cooling mechanism 
And so there's increase in amount of sweating. Uh, there's increase in skin blood flow. Well, why is that? Well, when the core body temperature goes up, the body is trying to regulate the temperature. I mean, when you know we put you in a sauna, it's 140 degrees or whatever the, the temperature is, you know, your body doesn't want to be 140 degrees. So it has to cool itself. So part of the cooling mechanisms is to ship blood from the core to the periphery. And it does that because, you know, the periphery is where the cooling is. And so you want to cool the body down. Also, sweating helps cool the body down. And so shifting blood flow to the skin uh, contributes to sweating as well. Uh, there's an increase in muscle uh, blood flow. Uh, the vasodilatory effects. And we'll talk about uh, some of those things. Remember, we just said that one of the mechanisms uh, of, um, of uh, infrared therapy is that it increases nitric oxide uh, production and nitric oxide dilates blood vessels. And so we're going to talk about some of that, especially when we get to the cardiovascular disease section. Heart rate is increased. Uh, cardiac output is increased. So we've done cardiac studies. And cardiac output is your total body circulation. So, you know, we may, we talk about cardiac output from the standpoint of liters per minute. So, you know, normal resting, you know, your body may benefit from, you know, three to four liters a minute. Or maybe if you're asleep, you know, two and a half to three liters a minute. Uh, but if you're out working or running, or, you know, climbing a ladder, carrying heavy things, it may need to get up to six or seven liters uh, uh, per minute. If you're fighting an infection or you know dehydrated, you know there may be increased metabolic demand on the body for whatever the reason may be. You may have an infection or wound that your body's trying to heal, so the cardiac output may have to go up. So the uh, total body circulation is cardiac output, and infrared therapy enhances that. It decreases systolic blood pressure. So there's some evidence that it could benefit uh, hypertension. There are some studies uh, with uh, individuals with hypertension getting clinical benefit. Uh, with uh, infrared therapy, uh, decreases systemic vascular resistance. All this is is the amount of restriction of flow that the blood vessels cause. So if you can think of all the arteries in your body as a, as kind of a pipeline, if you think those take those pipes and maybe you go from a, a six inch diameter pipe to a three inch diameter pipe because these arteries can constrict. Uh, well, if the pipe goes, if you, you imagine blowing through a straw that's, you know, you know two inches in diameter versus one that's half an inch in diameter, one is half an inch in diameter, it's gonna be harder to blow through because that's increased resistance to flow. And so that's what happens here. You decrease resistance to flow by decreasing the systemic vascular resistance. So the blood vessels, which may be constricted, dilate and flow is uh, improved. And so uh, delivery of oxygen uh, to uh, tissues and organs uh, is improved. Now, so how does IRT work? Um, as I said before, there's about 600 to 700 to 1,000 uh, nanometers wavelength. Um, and here you have uh, the wavelength going in, and there's a cellular photoreceptors. Our body are energy cells we charge, and so we can deal with energy charges. We don't think of our body as, as electrical devices or, or, or uh, devices that, are, that have an electrical charge, but they, they are. And so we have cellular photoreceptors. And by the way, raw plant-based foods uh, also have biophotons. And so uh, raw plant-based foods are electrically charged as well. So here we are talking about infrared therapy from a light source. But if you're eating raw plant-based foods, especially if you have, for instance, uh, people who have um, uh, sprouts uh, or microgreens that are in the dirt and they're, they're growing and you cut the microgreens and put them in your salad, the food is still alive, still living, if you will. And so it has an energy charge and, and green leafy vegetables that are out in the sun, they take the sunlight through photosynthesis and that radiant energy is then stored into a biophoton. So is that energy is transferred uh, to another energy source, uh, the uh, thermodynamics, conservation of thermodynamics, energy forces, sources are transferred uh, either to heat or another energy source. So when you eat raw plant-based foods, you're also uh, transferring an energy source uh, in the form of a biophoton uh, in your body and your body benefits from that charge. So it's not just the calories and the carbs and the protein and all of that, which we talk about, but the electrical charge 
in the food that we eat, if we're eating a raw plant-based nutritional regimen, it has a big impact. And so here you have a direct electrical source, which is um, infrared therapy. So uh, it can have wound healing and tissue repair effects. Uh, it can prevent tissue death. Uh, we have the medical term for that is apoptosis. Um, there's a release of inflammation. I'll show you some clinical studies uh, raised to that. Pain relief, uh, acute injuries can be treated effectively, uh, chronic diseases, uh, neurogenic pain, neurological problems, acupuncture. Uh, there's also um, uh, infrared acupuncture. We won't talk about that, but I, I did read a little bit about that. Uh, in some of my uh, uh, investigation. And, and it's safe. As, if Dr. Palmer were here tonight, she was busy uh, in the clinic today, but if she was here uh, tonight, she'd be able to tell you that they use it on babies in the neonatal unit. So it's a very safe uh, therapy. Now here, I'm showing you this uh, diagram. Uh, this is from some uh, data. Now they've done rat models and there may be some limited human data, but there's some proposed mechanisms of action of brain injury. And I'm not gonna talk a lot about the infrared therapy on brain injury, although there's some data, some preliminary data, but, but this is a nice diagram and some of the similar mechanisms that's proposed here are the mechanisms that are uh, uh, been found to be effective in heart disease. So if you look at here, you've got the uh, infrared light therapy, uh, it's penetrating the tissue. This could be the skull here. And so you have at the tissue level cells, you got, so this is a cell and you have the mitochondria of the nucleus. And so what's happening to the mitochondria, as we said earlier, increased production uh, ATP, questionable increased production of nitric oxide. Now there's also increased reactive oxygen species. And so, well, wait, what's that for? Remember, you know, these are the bad guys, but they, these things are used for breakdown. So maybe, you know, there's uh, inflammatory molecules or other types of things that need to be destroyed. Sometimes uh, cells that are old and broken down have to be destroyed. So, you know, there's a recycling process. So, you know, if you have injury, there's not only rebuilding, but there's cleaning up. If you've anybody's ever remodeled an old house, you, know, you go to the old house and you have to remodel it because, you know, there's a lot of trash that has to be thrown away. There's some old moldy wood or, or sheetrock that has to be pulled out. So there's a destructive process as well as a rebuilding process. So you have to have these other molecules. It also has a genetic effect. Uh, we, we refer to this as epigenetics. So epigenetics is the transcription of DNA material. So let me kind of digress a little bit. You know, when you think of genetics and people say, well, you know, my family, you know, has you know, disease X. And so I'm bound to have disease X. Disease X could be diabetes or whatever. Uh, that's your genetic predisposition. That's when you that's in your DNA. That's in your DNA blueprint. However, if a disease state is in your DNA blueprint, it does not have to be uh, expressed. The, the expression of diabetes, you can be a diabetic. Let's say you're, you know, 15 years old, your blood sugars are normal, your A1C is normal. Uh, but you have a strong family history of diabetes. Well, you have likely have diabetes in your DNA blueprint, but it doesn't mean you have to manifest the diabetes. Now, the manifestation of it uh, is what we refer to as epigenetics. That's the DNA uh, that gets transcribed through an you know, mRNA, uh, and then it goes to ribosomal process where you make proteins of different types, whether enzymes or whatever the case is, and these proteins or enzymes could be you know, positive enzymes or it could be in a disease state, negative enzymes. And so these things can predispose to a certain disease state. So the epigenetics is the expression of your genetic material. You can have a genetic predisposition to something and never manifest it throughout your life by having a healthy lifestyle. So we see here the infrared therapy has an effect on the epigenetics. It has an impact on what's expressed in the genes uh, here. And so even in the setting of traumatic brain injury, it can turn off certain genes that may be uh, having an adverse effect in traumatic brain injury or any other type of acute illness uh, that may be at play. So uh, I'm gonna take a quick break here. And what I wanna do is um, uh, go into the health benefits of infrared therapy in part two. Uh, in summary of part one, again, uh, infrared therapy um, is, is safe. It, it allows the use 
of, of the sunlight energy without the ultraviolet uh, therapy component. Uh, it penetrates you know, deep in the tissue if it's far infrared uh, therapy, and it actually has biochemical effects. So it's not just heating things up and causing you know, mechanical damage, but it has biochemical effects that leads to very specific physiological effects. And so this is essentially like uh, a, a uh, food source in the setting where you have an, a, a power source that's having biochemical effects just like a drug or a chemical of some other type would have. So anyway, stay tuned. We're going to come back uh, after the break and we're going to talk in part two and again, some health benefits and I'm going to share some studies with you. So y'all stay tuned. Okay, we're back. So next we're gonna talk about health benefits. And, and as I said at the outset, I was really surprised to find uh, uh, so much data. And, and again, I mean, as a cardiologist, I was really you know pleasantly surprised because there's the most data that I saw, in fact, the most definitive data uh, with infrared therapy was that in patients with cardiovascular disease. So, you know, I probably should talk about the cardio, this part two probably should be the cardiovascular benefits of infrared therapy, because that's going to be most of what I talk about. However, there are some other areas I'll talk about. Uh, and there is science in some of these other areas, but not nearly as strong, and the, the studies are not nearly as well done. And the findings are not as definitive as they are in cardiovascular disease. So it, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised because we see a lot of patients from, you know, all over the country with, you know, challenging cardiovascular uh, conditions. Uh, and and uh, it seems like, you know, the next patient is always upping the ante in terms of, you know, the, the uh, issues we're having to deal with. And so, you know, I'm excited to be adding this uh, uh, tool uh, in my armor material. And so uh, let's get into uh, cardiovascular uh, the health benefits. Uh, so part two health benefits of infrared therapy. Uh, what are the health benefits in general? As I said, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, congestive heart failure, cardiac arrhythmias, peripheral vascular diseases, all of these conditions have been shown to uh, be beneficially, uh, effectively treated uh, using um, infrared therapy as an adjunct. Uh, there's some data showing uh, benefit uh, with people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, inflammatory disease. I'll show you some data with uh, individuals with low back pain. Uh, there's studies done with patients with fibromyalgias, uh, who gets improvement uh, with infrared therapy, uh, metabolic diseases. Now, metabolic disease is a little uh, tricky. There's some data showing weight loss uh, is, is being uh, beneficial. Uh, patients with diabetes have benefit with wound healing, uh, but is that a vascular you know, treatment or is it a diabetes treatment? Well, diabetics, you know, by definition, have vascular disease and to prove otherwise, in my opinion, and it usually pans out. Uh, and so there's also immune, immune related disorders, uh, that's been shown to benefit, uh, from, um, uh, uh infrared therapy, particularly patients with cancer is also certain infections have been shown to be beneficial. I won't show you specific studies on those because they're the, the findings were not as widespread and definitive. And of course there are others. And, and of course, when we get into the, um, um, uh, discussion, we'll talk about maybe some other treatments. Before I get into this, I'm going to look at some of these. Uh, Zoro has a question here. Are there any health risks uh, for infrared sun? You know, it's been shown to be very safe. And I alluded to earlier, it's been used in babies even. Um, and um, so it's it's actually been shown to be safe. Uh, and as I'm going to share with you, patients with, you know, uh, pretty advanced heart failure, uh, have been shown to use it safely. Now there's specific protocols they use. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's no uh, evidence of what I've seen um, uh, of anybody abusing it. But but the, from the data I've looked at, there's been virtually no adverse effects in the studies that I've looked at. Uh, and there were pretty extensive studies uh, in terms of individuals with um, uh, who uses infrared therapy. So, so as far as the data shows, it's very safe. 
Uh, Karen, I had a chance to experience infrared sauna. A relative has one in her home, in-home spa, and offered it uh, additional full-body massage. I was busy chasing the hot sausage pro boy on French. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So um, somebody says, I have a sunlit and infrared uh, home sauna. Love it. Okay. Barbara Perlis. Yep. So uh, as I alluded to, many of you are already familiar with the infrared, and you probably could do this talk uh, yourself. Um, maybe I invite one of you on one day. So what is IRT and uh, infrared therapy and cardiovascular disease? Here's uh, evidence from a study. So, and this is a, a Japanese group that looked at repeated sauna treatment and uh, patients with vascular endothelial and cardiac function uh, and heart failure. And what they did is they measured vascular endothelial function and also looked at uh, cardiac function. Uh, and, and the findings were that the, the sauna therapy, infrared therapy, resulted in improvement in cardiac function uh, and in clinical syndromes. Now, if we look at some of the details of their findings, and, and again, excuse the busy slide that uh, highlighted some of the important uh, factors that we'll go through. Uh, New York Heart Association class. New York Heart Association class is basically a formal classification system by which we rate you according to your symptoms. So for instance, if your heart failure is so bad that you know, you're know short of breath at rest, it's a four. If your heart failure is so mild that you have you know no shortness of breath, even with moderate to significant you know exercise, then it's a one. Uh, if it's you know so bad that you have uh, it limits your functional status when you, you exert yourself mild to moderate amount, you get shorter breath or you're limited, then it's a three. And if you have to increase the intensity, you get shortness of breath, then it's around a two. So there's a one through four. Now we have now a new A, B, C, and D. Classification. I won't uh, bore you with that. The, the the important part about going to that little discussion is that there are four classes in New York Heart, and here they had patients that were started off in classes one through three, and um, they showed at baseline and the change in the treated group where they went from there was nobody in in class one when they started and when they finished there was one person in one. There were ten people in class two. And when they finished, there were 14. That means that about four people. So you, really, you look at this class three group and you say, well, you know, five people left the class three group because you had 10 to start with and then there's five. So five people went up. Four of them went to the class two and one of them went to the class one. So there's a pretty improved, significant improvement that has statistical significance. So the New York Heart class improvement. So these patients were getting better are having fewer symptoms. So their functional status was getting better, I should say. Systolic blood pressure uh, was decreased significantly uh, in these patients. Now, CTR stands for cardiothoracic ratio. Cardiothoracic ratio, I mean, we use these fancy medical terms. Basically, if you look at someone's chest x-ray, and any of you may have seen a chest x-ray, some of you are medical people, you know, the heart is a, there's a, a big silhouette in the middle of the chest x-ray, and you can measure the uh, diameter of the heart and compared to the diameter from one end of the chest to the other, it should be less than 50% or less than half. Uh, and if your heart's enlarged, it's greater than 50%, maybe greater than 55 by some people's criteria. But anyway, it went from 58% to 55. So it was still large, but it, it decreased in size. So that's all this means that the heart enlargement was decreased. Uh, BNP is a molecule, is a, a, a molecule that we measure in the blood of patients, and um, it stands for brain natriuretic peptide. Uh, this molecule is an increase when the heart is under a lot of stress, a lot of strain, and and typically in heart failure patients, that stress is due to the fact that it's it's volume overload and it's stretch. It doesn't have to be that. Sometimes it could be stress due to ischemia, not getting enough blood flow. So the different mechanism of the stress. But uh, BNP level higher in heart failure patients generally is worse. And if it goes down, it's an improvement. So there's a less stress on the heart function. So you saw a decrease in heart stress, a decrease in BNP. Um, this is a functional um, um, dilation. Fun uh, uh, and so uh, flow, excuse me, flow mediated dilation. So basically, it's just vascular dilation of the blood vessels. And so they looked at the percent uh, flow-mediated dilation. 
Um, they looked at with nitroglycerin or without without nitroglycerin, uh, and, and we do this test a lot. Uh, we'll constrict the blood vessels and we'll release it, and then uh, you look at a hyperemia because after the blood vessel has been restricted, it should you know uh, dilate excessively. So they looked at this, and this uh, improved uh, significantly with uh, uh, infrared therapy. So you see a lot of these hemodynamic parameters are biochemical parameters and hemodynamic parameters and functional parameters improve significantly. Um, the flow media uh, dilation here shows that improvement over time. Uh, and so, and this is with two weeks of treatment. So one thing I didn't emphasize here. So what did they do? The method is, so, and, and those of you who have saunas can really appreciate this because I don't know, many people probably spend 30 minutes, an hour in a sauna, but how, how long did they spend? Well, they uh, put it at 60 degrees Celsius, so it's 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and they were in the sauna for 15 minutes. And then afterwards they came out and then they were at bed rest for another 30 minutes with a warm blanket. And so they did that five days a week for two weeks. And so, um, for two weeks, patients had this treatment. Uh, now, they said daily for two weeks, but I think it was five days a week for two weeks. And I think I read that in one of the uh, discussions, but but we'll come to that, at least 10 to 14 treatments. So after just two weeks, they had these positive changes. So that was actually pretty impressive for a two-week intervention on top of the usual uh, medical therapy, et cetera. So that's chronic heart failure. Um, now, wound therapy, wound therapy is just another phrase that's used for infrared therapy. Um, they call it dry heat. Uh, they said in background, we developed wound therapy called soothing warm therapy. Uh, and it has, uh, uh, as previously described in as the other article. And so it's just dry heat instead of the wet saunas. So this study looked at uh, the prognosis of patients with chronic heart failure. So they looked at 120 patients with heart failure, and it was a prospective study. Now, these patients were a little bit sicker. They had class three and class four heart failure, and so, and they were in the hospital. That's the other thing. So they started the infrared therapy in the hospital. Now, this is not the United States. I mean, you know, we don't do infrared therapy in the hospitals here. And so they had five days of infrared therapy in the hospital, and then uh, after they were discharged, uh, they had, um, uh, they went at least twice a week, uh, and I think the follow-up was five years. So two at least two therapies a week for five years. Now, this is important. The reason I'm going through this, because, you know, from our standpoint, when we write our protocols for treatment, and if you have a therapy at home, you have one of these conditions, you want to treat yourself, it's important to know what they did in the study. They didn't, you know, treat them for five minutes. It was 15 minutes, and it was, you know, consecutive days in one study for two weeks in a row, consecutive days for five days, and then two days a week for a five-year period of time. And so, uh, and it was 140 degrees uh, temperature. So it's important to know these. So what did they see? They saw a very significant reduction. Uh, so the rehospitalization due to heart failure or cardiac death was 68.7% in the control group. So this is death or rehospitalization. They combined those two. And then in the treatment group, it was only 31.3%. Um, so again, a very powerful impact of infrared therapy. Now, just think if we were you know, putting a raw plant-based diet and MSM and Coenzyme Q10 and all the other things we treat, you can imagine how much more of an impact likely that you would have. Now, we got to do some studies ourselves looking at the potential additive effects. So this is not add, this is added on top of routine therapy. Uh, the question I would ask in the science, data needs to ask, what is the added benefit of infrared therapy to an antioxidant plant-based diet, super supplements, et cetera? And we're going to do that study and, and we'll present that data to you one day. Uh, but clearly a uh, very positive benefit here. Uh, and so this is something that I think is important for us uh, to take in consideration. Now, how about cardiac arrhythmia? You know, patients with heart failure, they die by two mechanisms. One is pump failure, which is an ugly way to die. Pump failure is simply when the heart just progressively gets weaker and weaker. When the heart gets weaker, the circulation uh, gets uh, suppressed over time. And with suppressed circulation, you know, your organs start to fail, the liver start to fail, the kidneys start to fail, 
your GI system, your appetite goes, your brain starts to fail, and it's really an ugly way to die. So we try to prevent that form of death. Sudden death, um, you know, it can be bad too, but sudden death is typically bad for the loved ones of the person with heart failure because they may die in their sleep or just drop dead one day uh, due to ventricular arrhythmia or, or some other cause of sudden death. Ventricular arrhythmia is the most common that we've identified in patients with heart disease. So we see that infrared therapy can decrease the pump failure mechanism, could improve cardiac performance, but can it uh, reduce risk of sudden death? Well, uh, according to this study, it has potential for that. So uh, they took patients with uh, class three, two and three uh, heart failure. <coughs> Excuse me. Now that's important because individual class two and three heart failure, they found studies that these are ones that are more likely to die from sudden death than class four. You would think that, well, that doesn't make sense. Uh, the reason is that by the time someone progressed to class four, uh, they have kind of, you know, passed through the risk factor. They, they typically selected themselves as someone who's not likely to die through an arrhythmia. Uh, and so class two and three heart failure patients have arrhythmias. So what they did is they put them on Holter monitors if they saw they had at least 200 uh, what we call PVCs, or premature ventricular contractions. These are extra beats that start from the ventricle. If they have more than 200 of those per 24 hours, they were enrolled in the study. And so what they did is uh, they looked at the group that was sauna treated and the non-treated group, and they saw that at baseline, these individuals had about over 3,000 PVCs per day. And after two weeks of treatment, that went to 800. That's a huge reduction. A non-treated group, no significant change. Now, when we, when I was an EP, I'm an electrophysiologist also. I, I'm an internal medicine cardiologist, cardiac electrophysiologist. And so in my electrophysiology training, I remember coming and we were looking at the use of antiarrhythmic drugs. So for instance, they did similar studies like this with antiarrhythmic drugs. So, I mean, we had these class one antiarrhythmic drugs. And back then, you know, they had, you know, like 20, uh, quinidine and, and other class one antiarrhythmic drugs that they use. Fleconide was one, so one C. Uh, so these drugs were used in patients who've had, uh, I think there was one study they used, uh, a patient who just had a heart attack or acute coronary syndrome, and they had frequent PVCs, they put them on an antiarrhythmic drug. So the theory was, if you give you an antiarrhythmic drug, we can decrease the risk of sudden death uh, by suppressing the PVCs, et cetera. But when they finished the study, they saw that there was an increase in sudden death in the people taking the drug compared to people taking a placebo. So the drugs were actually killing people. And it was the, that study, uh, we call it the CAST study, if I remember correctly, uh, is the one of the landmark studies that got us away from using class one antiarrhythmic drugs. In fact, the patients that have ventricular arrhythmias with heart failure, especially with structural heart disease, I give them a class, you know, you know, three drug or something like that you know, amiodarone, uh, which has a lot of side effects too, or sotalol, which, you know, they both have side effects, but they they don't increase sudden death. Uh, but infrared therapy reduces ventricular arrhythmias. Now, you will have to do other studies say, well, does it reduce sudden death? Well, there's another study I'm going to show you, which implies that it may. Uh, couplets, that's just two PVCs to, together, that was reduced, and long runs of uh, VT were reduced with infrared therapy. So this is actually very powerful data. And again, this is only two weeks of therapy, only two weeks of therapy. So uh, a pretty big impact uh, on arrhythmias. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, uh, the question that came to my mind is that, um, you know, could it have an impact on uh, uh, atrial fibrillation? And so we may do a study looking at atrial fibrillation. How about peripheral vascular disease? Uh, the same group uh, looked at individual peripheral vascular disease. Uh, sorry about the, the small print, um, but essentially what we're looking at here is individuals who have peripheral vascular disease, it's this bad circulation, and usually the symptoms are in the lower extremities. Uh, and so there were 20 individuals with uh, peripheral arterial disease. Uh, 15 had them in both legs and five had them in just one leg. Uh, and they had to have symptoms for more than four weeks. Uh, many of them had ulcers, uh, some had had amputations. So these are people with pretty bad circulation disease. Ankle breaker index, that's the ratio of the blood pressure in the arms to the legs. It had to be less than 0.9. Uh, and so uh, less than 0.9 is abnormal. You want it to be essentially equal or maybe a little bit higher in the arms and legs. So long story short, 
um, behind the legs and the arms. Long story short is that uh, less than 0.9 is pretty bad. So they have pretty bad peripheral vascular disease. When you think about it, your legs, you're on your feet a lot, and uh, it's a weight-bearing extremity compared to the arm. So you're going to have more flow in that area, and you're likely to have need more flow. So the pressure is going to be a little bit better, higher uh, in that area as well. Uh, so what was the protocol? I highlighted this a little bit better. So they... Uh, same things what they did with the heart failure patients, you know, 140 degrees Fahrenheit or six degrees Celsius for 15 minutes, followed by 30 minutes of uh, warm blankets. Uh, they did the therapy uh, once a day for five days a week for a period of 10 weeks. And that's why I got the five days a week. So they took Saturday and Sunday off. And so, you know, when they did the two week data, it's, it's five days a week for two weeks. This is five days a week for 10 weeks. Uh, and uh, that's a little statistical thing. So what did they find? This is a busy slide, but I highlight. So you got patient number one all the way through patient number 20. And you read across here is a female, 79, uh, had previous surgery, no, but she had a leg ulcer. And what happened after the treatment? So this is baseline outcome after the treatment. Uh, leg ulcer completely healed. Patient two, leg ulcer, toe ulcer. Leg ulcer completely healed, toe ulcer improved. Um, you have, again, Claudication is a medical term, which means you have pain with ambulation. Uh, it's an achiness or fullness. So this claudication, uh, it's it's oftentimes limit people from walking. So they have a bad claudication, they'll walk maybe you know ten feet, have to stop, rest, let the you know flow uh, circulation improve, then walk another ten feet, stop. So what happens is that after the therapy, the walking distance increased. So they were able to walk farther before they had to stop. All that showed significant improvement. Ulcers improve, ulcers improve, completely heal, improve. And so you had improvement in just about everybody. Uh, had some people rest pain, rest pain went away. Uh, so the circulation improved uh, very significantly uh, in this population, individuals treated. Uh, excuse this busy slide, but you had the pain score. It went down significantly as the previous slide alluded to with claudication going up. The walking distance went up significantly uh, as the, uh, this is the, the claudication, so the walking distance went up. The ABI improved some, uh, and also the um, uh, laser Doppler uh, perfusion uh, improved significantly. So you had improvement in circulation uh, and decrease in pain and improvement in, in functional status. So all these things are lining up. There's a physiology, uh, is, is, is showing improvement. Uh, the clinical symptoms such as the perception of pain and the functional status is all going in the right direction. So it's a correlation across. Now, this one uh, study was, was very impressive. So, uh, and this is a, a Finnish group, I think it is. Uh, they looked at the association between sauna bathing and fatal cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. Now, when you look at studies, you look at a treatment, you say, oh, you know, um, does it save lives over time? And, and with this study, you can make the argument that maybe we should be using infrared therapy in mainstream medicine because it's a pretty uh, important study. It's a prospective cohort study. Basically, you're looking at, you're prospectively looking at people. So you're looking at them, you know, at this point and out to the future, <coughs> excuse me, and um, you're looking at people of a similar group. So this is people with cardiovascular disease, and uh, it was population-based sample. So uh, even though you didn't have them in a control setting where you were following them, you you did do interviews and and you did uh, questionnaires and you assess the amount of sauna therapies they were getting per week. And we'll get into that in the, the next slide. Uh, so there are about 2,315 middle-aged uh, men from Eastern Finland, so age 42 to 60. Now, some people can argue, well, these were you know, Anglo-Saxon men, you probably can't extrapolate it to, you know, other populations. And, and you can make that argument, but cardiovascular disease has similar, you know, footprints. And, and, and so I think, you know, with, with the treatment that's, that's, you know, has low risk, uh, I think more studies need to be done. I agree with that assessment if someone were to make that. But I think, you know, um, off-label use or some uh, limited use should be considered, especially with people with advanced disease, when we have no other modalities to help them. You know, this is certainly something that should be considered. Uh, so 
what happened? Results, uh, people that had one sauna treatment. So basically there was, uh, the groups were uh, people that had you know, one sauna treatment a week uh, versus individual that had, I think it had it up here. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, one sauna treatment a week, two to three sauna uh, treatments a week, four to seven sauna treatments per week. So one sauna treatment is the first group, that's 601. Two to three sauna bathings, that was 1,500. That was the largest group. And four to seven is about 201. So what did they find statistically? Well, cardiovascular risk factors, um, so cardiovascular disease risk factors in the groups compared to one sauna. So one sauna was the baseline. So we had one sauna, you were the you were either the baseline group. So was there a hazard ratio? And the hazard ratio basically is, is the risk of hazard. So if the risk of hazard is above one, then it's an increased risk. If it's below one, it's a decreased risk. So the hazard ratio was 0.78. So if you take one and subtract 0.78, you get 0.22. Uh, and so that was a 22% reduction uh, in cardiovascular risk factors in people that took two to three sauna baths compared to one. Uh, if you took four to seven sauna baths compared to one, there was a 63% reduction. So the hazard ratio of 0.37, again, one minus 0.37 is a 63 or 0.63 or 63% reduction of risk because if it was an increased risk, it would be a 1.37, but it's a reduction in risk, so the hazard ratio is 0.37. And so that shows that it was a decreased risk of uh, cardiovascular disease. So if you look at uh, all-cause mortalities, in other words, all-cause of dying, and there was significant statistical significance among these groups. So if you had baseline being 11 minutes uh, of, of um of bathing uh, per per sauna bathing, uh, then if you bathe from 11 to 19 minutes, there's about a seven percent reduction uh, in your uh, hazard risk of all cause mortality. And if you increase it to about 19 minutes, oops, 19 minutes, there was about a 52 percent. Notice that 11 to 19 hovers around that 15 minute treatment. Remember, in the heart failure patients, they were being treated for 15 minutes. So if you uh, start at 11 minutes, you've not got no benefit. And those who were at more than 19 minutes, you were at 15 minutes or more. So what that means is that group in this 11 to 19 minutes, there were some who were below that 15 minutes. So that 15 minute treatment might be the lower end of normal. There's some scientific data show that there's a, a biphasic effect, meaning that, that at, at the lower amount of uh, duration of treatment, you have less effect then you get to like a sweet spot somewhere in the middle, but the longer you go, you get lesser effect. So we don't really know where that biphasic effect is. So 15 minutes we know from some of the other studies I share, we know is effective. This study implies that it could be 20 minutes, you know, maybe 25 or 30 minutes, you know, that could be even uh, more effective. So somebody needs to do a study looking at the duration effect of infrared therapy, but clearly uh, this study show all cause mortality uh, 19 minutes or more was beneficial. That doesn't mean it was good if you did 45 minutes. Maybe 45 minutes doesn't add anything to it, or maybe it takes it away. So we have to do more studies to show that, but very interesting. But the thing is that increased frequency of sauna bathing is associated with reduced risk of sudden cardiac death, cardiac heart disease, cardiovascular disease, and all cause mortality. Very, very important uh, data there because, you know, again, it shows that individuals with heart disease probably should be buying. Uh, a, a infrared sauna. Now you can't just get any one. And um, I, I, I regret that I didn't put a slide on here talking about the different ones. I'll make some comments on uh, some of these things. Uh, I spent a lot of time on cardiovascular disease because that's where most of the the, the data is. You, you know, the old saying, Willie Sutton, why did you rob banks? Is well, that's where the money is. So you know, why did you talk about heart disease? Well, I'm a cardiologist. And, you know, not, some people say that's where the money is too, not necessarily, but that's certainly where the data is in terms of this topic. Uh, but it does have effect on low back pain. Uh, there was a pretty decent study uh, that I found here. So infrared therapy on chronic low back pain. Uh, this is a randomized control trial. Uh, 21 patients receive uh, infrared therapy and 18 receive placebo. Now, the interesting thing here is they strapped a band around uh, their backs. And so the infrared therapy was an infrared therapy device. 
And so the individuals getting the therapy, and I'll, I'll warn everybody, I'm going to go a little bit over time because I'm going to finish my slides and I'll look through some questions and comments. But the, the individuals getting placebo were also strapped in the device, and, um, but there was no power connection. So they didn't know whether they were getting you know, infrared therapy or not. Now, that's important because, you know, there's a placebo effect. And so, you know, oftentimes we do therapies like heart surgeries and stents. And we say, okay, people did the stent, they did well, but we don't do placebo effects. And so look at placebo effects. There was recent some studies looking at elective angioplasty and the placebo effect. And it showed that there's a very strong placebo effect. And it was in, in some uh, individuals getting elective angioplasty, there's no difference in the symptoms of, 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 of chest discomfort with the people getting the real angioplasty compared to people getting the stents. And so are, are people getting the fake procedure? So they go in and stick you, go on and pretend like they're doing a procedure, but you don't get any stent. Another group get the stent. And they compared those groups. They saw no significant difference in terms of how they felt. So there's some something to be said about when you do these uh, tests, you have to do what we call a sham procedure. And that's what was done here. So uh, principal measure outcome, essentially numerical rating for uh, pain. Um, and so what they found is that they was associated with de decrease uh, reduction, uh, significant reduction in chronic low back pain and no adverse effects. So it's safe. Here's the device. You, know, you can strap it around the person, the Velcro, and you had the treatment devices. So you got the same thing if you had um, uh, the placebo or the device. You just didn't get the true stuff. Uh, group one uh, or zero, uh, this is the treatment group, has significant reduction. Uh, placebo group is uh, this group one rather and group zero here. So the pain scale did not change significantly. There was a little bit of change here in the placebo. So there was some placebo effect of being hooked up to the device, but there was a very dramatic reduction uh, in, uh, uh, in those who got the real treatment. Uh, very impressive. So thanks for your attention. I know it's a long um, uh, presentation and some of the slides are busy. If you have time, go through and maybe make take pictures of them. Uh, do screenshots or the like. Uh, I'm going to entertain some of the questions in the chat uh, for the next few minutes. So if you have any questions you haven't typed in, please type them in. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Riley, thank you. Let's see. Uh, good to hear. Last year, I bought a personal infrared sauna for my home. So people are making good investments. Uh, check out your sauna. Make sure it's low EMF. Now, I didn't talk about that, but you know, look at your saunas and make sure it's low EMF uh, saunas. Uh, are there any health risks uh, from infrared sauna? Uh, very safe, Zoro. Um, uh, it's uh, nothing has been identified in the data. And you've had, if you saw some of the studies, they treat patients for years. Um, Senator Dukes, yep, me and my wife uh, will look into this ASAP. And I'll give you some information on that um, uh, over time, too. We're going to, I may. In our next talk, we'll, um, uh, we will actually uh, share some information on uh, some good sources. But if you just look uh, up the infrared, we want to do far infrared and low EMF. That's if you're looking it up, far infrared and low EMF. Uh, and there's a company called um, Heat with Therapy or uh, Clear Infrared. Uh, they're pretty good. I've been looking at their stuff. So, but infrared, uh, far infrared is key and heat. So, uh, let me know when you reach out to Dr. Miller, probably, you know, okay, we'll do. Uh, and um, see who else here. The study said 15 minutes. Would it be risky to increase the time and treatment each day to 30 minutes and skip the warm blanket? You know, I don't think so. 30 minutes, I think it's fine. And the other study that I alluded to, the patient that did 19 minutes or more still had increased improvement. So it's possible that you're getting more benefit uh, up to 15. So I would say, um, you know, maybe you can do 30 minutes. I don't, I don't think it's too bad. I would say maybe 20 minutes is definitely, uh, uh, safe because there's two studies that show once they definitely 15 minutes and there's another study. So that people that did 90 minutes or more were better. So if you did 20, 25 minutes, you're probably within that sweet zone and 30 minutes still may be within that sweet zone, but certainly 20 minutes, uh, uh 30 minutes because of that other study. Um, let's see, what are the temperatures? In the, the CV mortality study, the temperatures were 60 degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And it was that same Japanese group that did all of that work with the cardiovascular disease patients. No, that was the Finnish group that also did it. Now, the Finnish group, the sonnets, we don't know the temperatures because they actually based it on patients' uh, 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 testimony. So we don't know the temperatures in that lot. But there was another CV mortality uh, study with smaller numbers, and, and that was prospectively done. And that the temperature there was 140 degrees. So I think it'd be safe going 140 degrees uh, Fahrenheit um, uh, with these treatments. Uh, does it matter the angle direction at which the infrared light hits you? You know, that's a great question. And I'm going to say I don't know the answer to that large because, you know, we have some great studies, but they haven't looked at, you know, angulation. Can you be lying flat with these people sitting up? It wasn't even mentioned in the study. So uh, based on the data I've looked at, and there's some good data, but we haven't looked at all of this, um, I suspect that getting here's, I'm going to give you my theory as an expert. So the cardiovascular effects are likely going to be mediated by nitric oxide, nitric oxide production. Now, red blood cells uh, uh, can produce nitric oxide when uh, uh, interfaced with uh, infrared uh, light therapy. So if you consider your vascular flow, your aorta and all the blood vessels, more exposure gets more blood, red blood cells exposed to infrared therapy and therefore more infra, uh, nitric oxide production in theory. That's my theory. So I suspect having large parts of your body is exposed to it, sitting upright. Uh, if, you, if you're in an uh, infrared chamber, having the infrared light hits you in the chest and other areas, get you the greatest exposure in that period of time. It may also uh, allow you to have a shorter period of time. So those you don't like sitting in a hot uh, sauna, infrared sauna, for you know 30, 40 minutes, maybe if you're sitting upright, uh, you can get you know uh, more exposure than if you're lying down. And that might be an interesting study to do as well. So um, uh, thank you, Barbara. Appreciate it. Uh, does the parasympathetic nervous system truly kick in only? when sweating uh, in uh, an infrared sauna? I don't think so. I think um, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system is, is actually a, a tricky uh, situation. And I think the different mechanisms uh, as to what triggers a, a parasympathetic uh, nervous system activity depends on what's happening to you. Uh, uh, some individuals who are having a heart attack and it's you know a right coronary artery lesion, they gonna have a vagal spell. That's gonna be more of a parasympathetic uh, overdrive. Uh, people who have a vagal spell just due to neurocardiogenic syncope, you have a parasympathetic overdrive and they may, may become sweaty associated with that. Uh, so it doesn't have to be um, uh, due to infrared therapy uh, or the like. So anyway, um, so on the real food, my question wasn't worded correctly. Uh, okay, that's okay. Send it uh, later and I'll answer it in the chat. So Anyway, uh, we're over time and it's, uh, you know, I'm glad we had this time together. Uh, but, you know, it's this is a very in, intriguing um, uh, topic. Uh, and as I delved into the literature more, uh, I really became um, very excited with the benefits uh, of this treatment at such low level. It's something that we're going to start utilizing in our center. Uh, we're going to start patients off with it, and we're probably going to encourage some people to invest in getting these things in a home uh, in addition to, you know, other things we'll be recommending over time. Uh, so, um, you know, if you got good information, enjoy this, please subscribe. Please, please, please share this with anyone and everyone you think would benefit uh, from this information, because I think that sharing this knowledge is very beneficial uh, I think individuals with heart failure, especially high blood pressure, other vascular disease. I mean, you, if someone gets this information, invest in infrared therapy or start getting it done, they may save a limb. Uh, so there are a lot of things that can help you know, individuals improve their overall life and well-being. And just a little bit of knowledge sometimes can go a long way. So anyway, it's been great. I look forward to seeing you next week. I think I'm going to talk about hyperbaric oxygen therapy next week. Uh, and then we'll be bringing some guests in um, next month. Chef Babette, I'm going to try to get her in on the first Monday of June. Uh, but next next Monday, which is the 31st, uh, we'll be talking about hyperbaric oxygen therapy because that's another therapy that has some benefits uh, in different um, uh, aspects of our lives. 
And uh, I think it's important for us to discuss that. Until then, keep it fresh, natural, and live. Thank you.